Amen. Mark chapter 16. So that's going to be our uh, core scripture for uh, this evening, or not this evening, this morning, on uh, talking about Resurrection Sunday. So it's this, one of the, the four gospel accounts of the resurrection. If you look, uh, we're going to start really at verse number two, um, but uh, the resurrection is, uh, you know, started out in verse uh, number one of um, when, you know, they're coming to the tomb, and of course Jesus is not there. Of course, um, I'm not going to get into this in detail this morning. Um, we're going to talk about the resurrection and what that means for us this morning. But um, a lot has happened over the last uh, few days um, before, you know, after the crucifixion of Jesus. Of course, Jesus was crucified on Wednesday, not Friday, um, as people would say today, you know, Good Friday. Um, as Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 40 says, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, again, showing that the, everything that happens in the Old Testament was a picture of the coming Messiah. The Bible then continues, it says, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, of course, three days and three nights, um, that puts Jesus as crucified on Wednesday. He died in the afternoon on Wednesday, which was the day of preparation before the day of the Passover, which was Thursday. Um, if you go and study this through the Bible, this is really the only way that makes every account in the Bible make sense. Um, there's two Sabbath days. That's kind of the, the trick here is uh, to make all the accounts make sense is that Thursday was a Sabbath as well. So that's where people get really tripped up, Thursday being the Passover. And, you know, Jesus being killed on the day of preparation, the day before Passover, also makes sense because that's when the Passover lamb was killed. You know, the Passover lamb was killed during the day of preparation for the Passover. And, of course, we know that Jesus is the Passover. So it makes uh, perfect sense. But we're going to talk about the resurrection this morning. Let's start out at verse number 2. Of course, they, and Jesus resurrected. Uh, we don't know the exact time that Jesus resurrected, but it was sometime between su Saturday evening and early Sunday morning. So the first day of the week would be Sunday. Look at verse number 2. It says, And very early in the morning, the first day, they came unto the, to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said unto themselves, these are the women, who shall, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. It was a huge stone. They were worried that they wouldn't be able to uh, move it themselves. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he said unto them, Be not affrightened, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So this morning, I want to tell you, this of course is the account that Jesus rose um, from the dead. The rest of Matthew, or uh, Mark chapter 16, talks about some things that happened after Jesus rose from the dead. Physically, bodily, by the way, um, he ate, people touched him. Um, he, this was a bodily resurrection, okay? This isn't um, some spirit, spirit walking around. This was a bodily resurrection of Jesus in his glorified body. So this morning, I want to talk about three things that the resurrection bought you. Three things. As a saved believer this morning, as somebody that's trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. You say, what does the resurrection mean to me? So I'm going to give you three specific things that the resurrection has bought or purchased for you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first one, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because I preached a whole sermon on this um, about a week and a half ago, but the first thing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ buys us is it gives us hope or a guarantee for our physical resurrection. We know that one day we will be physically resurrected, and I preached through a sermon about just the detail of your physical resurrection, when that's going to happen, how that's going to go, um, just a week and a half ago. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse number 20. So the first thing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ buys you is the hope of your physical resurrection. We know that we will be resurrected one day because Jesus was resurrected. The Bible tells us this. Look at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So when people die, they're asleep in Jesus, the Bible says. They die, they are immediately in heaven. There is no soul sleep. I went through all this in the sermon on your physical resurrection. But we know that we will be physically resurrected because Jesus was first physically resurrected. He was the first fruits, meaning he was the first one, and then the first resurrection will be all 
of us. For since by man came death, and by man also the resurrection of the dead. So the Bible here is saying is that, you know, since man brought death, since man brought physical death, you say, why do I even need a physical resurrection? Because man brought physical death to this world. That's why. It says, by, all, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. You say, by man? Well, yes, by the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, look at the next verse. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So you're guaranteed a physical resurrection if you're saved this morning because Jesus rose from the dead. You know, the significance of this, turn to Romans chapter 5. Basically, he's saying that, you know, look, it was man that brought death to the world. Okay, it wasn't God that brought death to the world. God did not want it that way. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. It kind of gives us another um, angle about this or another explanation of this. Romans chapter 12 and verse, Romans chapter 5, I'm sorry, and verse number 12. Just comparing as one man brought sin to the world, another man, you know, solved the problem, basically, is what God is saying here. Look at Romans 5, 12. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. See, God warned man. God warned man before this even happened, before Romans 5, 12 even happened, God warned man that this would happen, that death would come into the world. We're talking about why we need a physical resurrection, because death has come into the world because of what one man did. God warned man. Look at Genesis 2.17. Genesis 2.17, the first book of the Bible. The Bible says, God gave a specific direction here. He says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. He's saying you can eat anything you want in the garden. You can eat of all these trees, all these things. He's like, but of this one tree, you cannot eat. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Bible says God literally told man, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Which is interesting because what did Satan in the serpent tell Eve? He said, thou shalt not surely die. He literally told her exactly that. He didn't tell her some little twist. He didn't tell her, you know, some little different version. He told her the exact opposite of what God said. It's like, thou shalt not surely die. Then man, of course, didn't listen. Turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter 8. This is why in John chapter 8, you know, this is why, you know, Jesus, he describes Satan this way. He describes Satan as a certain type of person in John chapter 8 and verse number 44. Look, it's interesting. It's interesting that God had to literally come and fix what Satan said wouldn't happen. It's just kind of an interesting thought. Satan said, thou, thou shalt not surely die. Well, then why did God have to come and fix it? Why did God have to come and fix the machine if it wasn't broken? But the machine was broken. So we see who was telling the truth and who was not. Do you think God would have gone through all of this, all of the study that we've gone through of the life of Jesus, of the suffering of Jesus, of the humiliation of Jesus, and, and finally the death on the cross of Jesus if nothing was broken? But something was broken, and death was in the world and Jesus came to fix it. Look at John chapter 8 and look at verse number 44. The Bible says, Ye are of your father the devil. Jesus is saying, you know, this is who Satan is. He says, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He, meaning Satan, meaning the devil, was what? A murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. It's not like he tells the truth some of the time, and then other times he lies. It says there was no truth in him. And look what he says. A lot of times people will misquote this and say, oh, he was a liar from the beginning. No, it says he was a murderer from the beginning. You say, how is he a murderer? Because he told them to do something that would kill them. He, he essentially murdered them. He essentially led them into dying. It says, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. By lying, he killed them, or encouraged them to basically kill themselves, is what happened here. He's the father of lies. This is why, 
You know, you see so many things in the world today. This, is, this, this verse explains why you see so many things in the world today that aren't just a little bit different from the Bible. They're the opposite of the Bible. You look at, you know, you look at how everything's fake. You look at, you know, global homo. You look at all the, the queerness and all the perversion. And you look at all this stuff. It's not a little bit different than the Bible. It's the opposite of what the Bible says. Because it's of Satan. That's why. Because he's the, he's, he was a murderer from the beginning, and there is no truth in him. There's no truth in him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So Jesus came and he fixed the problem. Why a resurrection? Why a resurrection? Why a physical resurrection for us? I talked about you know, the mechanics of your resurrection how that's going to go, at what part of the end times you are actually going to be physically resurrected. How does that fit in with the Antichrist? How does that fit in with the tribulation? How does that fit in with, you know, all the, the wrath of God? You know, where is my resurrection going to be? That's what we talked about a week and a half ago. But why do I even need a physical resurrection? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 9. So we're guaranteed the first thing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ buys you is the hope of your physical resurrection. You say, why do I need one? I think I look pretty good now. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What the Bible here is saying is that, you know, nobody that, I mean, a lot of people will teach works-based salvation using this, this verse here. But if you're teaching works-based salvation using 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9 through 11, nobody's going to heaven. <laughs> nobody's going to heaven. Because no one's going to be without sin in their lives. What the Bible is saying is that your vile self, your vile body can't go to heaven. Amen. Instead, not only are you sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ, but you actually need a glorified body before that body can go to heaven. Amen. That's what this is saying. We can't go like this. We can't go with this corrupt body. So our soul will go to heaven, and at the first resurrection, our glorified body will go. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. So we just can't go in this body. So now we have a, we have a hope of a, of a physical resurrection because Jesus rose from the dead. You say, well, how could Jesus rise from the dead? No, the Bible literally says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38, and I just read for you in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 40, where Jesus will be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. That's hell. Yep. Jesus' soul was three days and three nights in hell. That's why, you know, people that are like, you know, the resurrection or the, the crucifixion was Friday, and that three days and three nights was just figurative. Well, what? The Bible's only figurative when it says when it's clearly stating that, hey, this is a parable. It's like unto, it's like as, like these things. It says, no, so shall. For as, Jonas, three days and three nights. You know, if we just take three days and three nights and say, that's figurative speech, I guess we could make the world billions of years old, too. No, the Bible is literal, and what Jesus says is literal unless specifically stated otherwise. So three days and three nights, Jesus' soul was in hell. You say, how could Jesus, how could Jesus conquer that? Because, look, that is death. That is where the dead are, in hell. If you die and your soul goes to hell, that's literally called the second death. That's the death of your soul. That's where the dead are. We will never be dead if we're, sa if we're saved. If you're saved this morning, you will never be dead. But Jesus went where the dead are. Why? So he could conquer death. Look down at Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse number 18. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 18. For I am he that liveth and was dead. People that don't believe, I don't know how you could not believe that Jesus' soul went to hell when the Bible says it explicitly. The Bible literally just says it explicitly, that that's what happened. Oh, but I, it doesn't matter what you think or how you feel. That's what the Bible says 
happened. Amen. Oh, the, one of, the, one of the, the arguments, God can't die. You're saying God died? I am he that was living and was dead. Like, that doesn't mean God was dead, didn't exist, all these things. Just read the Bible and listen to what the Bible's saying. He's, he was in hell is what this was saying. He was where the dead are. But the difference between Jesus and everybody else in hell is he's got the keys to get out. That's the difference. That's why only Jesus could have done this. Only Jesus could have done this. Because hell, I just, I, I'm building kind of a shed that's turned into kind of a barn in my house. I put the door on it yesterday, and I put a lock on the door. And on the outside of the door is where you put the key. On the outside of the door. Hell is like the lock switched around. Where the key's on the inside. It gets locked from the outside. So if you're in there and you don't have the key, there's no getting out. And guess what? Only one person has the key to hell. And that's what the Bible says here. It says, I am alive forevermore, amen, and what? And have the keys of hell and of death. That's why God had to do this for us. That's why this broken machine that one man broke, there was only one man that could fix it. Amen. Why? Because Jesus has the keys. Anybody that goes to hell is not getting out. Jesus is the only one that had that key. Amen. So look, the resurrection, it gives us hope for our physical resurrection, as we studied in detail over the last couple of weeks. You say, but what about now? But what about now? Doesn't, you know, the resurrection of Jesus, doesn't that, doesn't that buy me anything now? I mean, that's great that I'm going to be physically resurrected one day. Turn to John chapter 3. Well, I got some good news for you this morning. I got some good news for you because you are going to be physically resurrected one day, but the second thing that the resurrection bought you, look, there's a difference between the physical and the spiritual. This is why people didn't understand Jesus because they weren't, they weren't understanding that he was speaking spiritually many times. There's a difference between the physical and the spiritual. Guess what? You are already or spiritually resurrected. The Bible says that if you're saved, you are spiritually resurrected. In a moment. Look at John chapter 3. This is why Nicodemus couldn't understand what Jesus was saying. Look at John chapter 3. Because why? Because Jesus was talking spiritually. He was talking spiritually, and Nicodemus was just thinking, he was just thinking physically. He was just thinking spiritually. Just like he was thinking physically when he should have been speaking spiritually. Just like I am the bread of life. Oh, we have to eat you? He was speaking spiritually. Look at John chapter 3, verse number 3. Look. You have hope for your physical resurrection because of the resurrection. That's the first thing. The second thing is, though, you can know today that if you're saved, you are already spiritually resurrected as you sit here this morning. Look at John chapter 3, verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? He's thinking physical. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Not talking about baptism, talking about physical versus spiritual. He's talking about you must be physically born and be spiritually born. He said, and then he explains it. You're like, well, I don't believe you. Well, look at verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. The moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon him, you are spiritually resurrected. You are born again. You are spiritually born again. Turn to Romans chapter 6. We just read this in the announcements. Look at Romans chapter 6. So look, that's some pretty good news. That that spiritual resurrection has already happened. It happens. Look, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Like, hath means you have it now. Like, when you believeth on the Son, what causes you to call upon Him, you have it. Just like that, you are spiritually resurrected at that moment. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. Talking about baptism, but more importantly here, it's talking about how you're already spiritually reborn. Therefore, we are buried with Him 
by baptism into death that like as see see how this see see there, there's a there, there's like a metaphor like as it's it's comparing it's saying just like it's a picture of is what this means like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also will for sure walk in newness of life no it says we also should walk in what in newness of life well those three words at the end of that verse newness of life guess what when you're saved you have that newness of life this is what it's talking about it's talking about your spiritual rebirth your spiritual resurrection that's the newness of life that you have look you should walk in that you should you know and the first you know first part of that is like the picture of that is baptism that your willingness to walk in that newness of life but you have the newness of life it's there it's there this is just it's talking about baptism is a picture of you being willing to walk in it all right but the newness of life is that spiritual resurrection that you've already been given this is all pretty good news for you this morning that's why the Christian life we talk a lot about you know getting sin out of your life and preaching every word of the Bible and all these things I, I stand up and yell and scream at you that you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. But really, when you look at you know, the things that we've been given because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you look at the, the idea that we're going to have a physical resurrection one day, but even better on top of that, we already have been given this spiritual rebirth. It's like we just, he just gave that to you just for trusting on Jesus. We just got that right away. The Christian life is really about loyalty. I mean, that's really what it's about. Yeah, obedience, yes. But I mean, really, when you come down to it, it's really just loyalty. Amen. Loyalty to the God that gave you these things. Loyalty to the God that, that gives you everlasting life and has given you these gifts to go along with it. Go back to Mark chapter 16. Go back to Mark chapter 16. So, I mean, when you think of these things that we've been given by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, taking that action out of just loyalty to somebody that's, that's given you these things. Look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15. This is really interesting here. Now, hopefully, you'll, this, these two verses will make more sense to you. Look at Mark chapter 16, and look at verse 15. And he, saith, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, now look, we, we, that's why we go soul winning. That's why we go out. This direct, easy to understand command in the Bible, that's why we go out preaching the gospel to every creature. But now look at verse 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So, first of all, just get this out of the way. People like use this one verse to say, oh, you have to be baptized to be saved. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. He that believeth and puts, uh, installs carpet for a living shall be saved. He that believeth and drove a pickup to church this morning shall be saved. He that believeth and, you know, is a, is a construction worker shall be saved. He that believeth and is lazy shall be saved. He, see, see what I'm saying? I can put anything in here. But what makes you to go to hell? What makes you damned? believe it not. Amen. So it's very simple. But the reason that baptism is put in there is because baptism is a picture of us wanting to walk the walk. Baptism is a picture of us wanting to actually walk in that newness of life, of wanting to identify with the Savior that saved us and walk in newness of life. And what's verse 15 right before that? He's saying, hey, I need you to walk. Amen. I need you to do works. I need you to, hey, now that I've done all these things for you, given you everlasting life, promised you a, a physical res re resurrection, given you that newness of life right now, giving you that spiritual rebirth right now. He's like, hey, could you go tell other people how to get this? Amen. Could you go do this for me? That's why baptism is, is just kind of a neat thing to bring up right there because it pictures a Christian who is saved that wants to walk Amen. in that newness of life. There's plenty of Christians that will never walk in newness of life. It doesn't mean that they don't have that life. Because God promised before the world began. And God cannot lie. So look, the Christian life is really just about loyalty. You know, it's about loyalty. I mean, when we separate from sin, that's, that's about loyalty. 
You know, when we, when we actually start doing the work, that's, that's us just being loyal to God. It's just our, it's, it's, it's our showing our willingness to walk in the way that Jesus wants us to walk. But most Christians won't. But that doesn't mean, that's no excuse for, for, for us. You know, before I was, before I was saved, you know, think, just thinking about, you know, you know, go to, you know, go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, that's not complicated. That's not a complicated command. You know, but before I was saved, I, I was still in church. Before I was saved, I, I went to church all the time. You know, once a week or whatever it was at the Lutheran church. But you know what? I was never taught that I should tell anyone the gospel. Not that I would have known what that was. But I wasn't even ever taught when I was going to church before I was saved. I wasn't even taught that I should even go talk to anybody about Jesus. Isn't that weird? But that's how, that's how churches are today. You know, churches are social clubs today. As a matter of fact, I can remember, I can remember conversations after church in the Lutheran church. And those conversations were, were always about business. There was about uh, work. There was about recreation or hunting or fishing or whatever. The Bible, that would have been weird if somebody would have brought up something about the Bible in those conversations after church. It was just unheard of. It was almost like there was a culture where you just didn't talk about spiritual things. It, it seems very, very strange and foreign to me now, of course. But this is the culture that I was raised in. This is the culture of the church that I went to. But you know what? Then I started, like, I had a lot of logical inconsistencies. Things didn't make sense. And I started reading the Bible, which it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I started listening to preaching on the Bible. I got, I got saved in there somewhere. I got saved whilst reading the Bible, seeking the truth, as Matthew 7 says. I was seeking, and I was shown the truth. And as I, as I got saved, there was still a short period where we, were st we still hadn't left the Lutheran church. I mean, like, just a couple weeks. And I remember asking the pastor of the church, I mean, I was saved at this point, and just reading simple verses like Matthew 16, 15. Like, that's not like end time prophecy right there. It's like, go preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and I remember asking the pastor, like, shouldn't we be? I, I think I might have asked this question, like, before I was even saved, by the way. You know, I'm just starting to figure things out and get things put together. And I just asked the pastor of that Lutheran church, like, shouldn't we be doing this? Because I remember we lived in Texas for many, many years, and the Baptists would be going around knocking the doors and, and preaching the gospel to people. And I remember asking this Lutheran pastor, shouldn't we be doing what they're doing? I mean, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to figure this out. And he just said, he's like, I remember, I'll never forget the answer. He's just like, we're not that kind of church. Yeah. That was a truthful answer. The only more truthful he could have been is, we're not a church. Because there's no candlestick there. There's nothing but an accursed false gospel there, is all there was. Which brings me to the third thing, that the resurrection bought you. See, when I got saved, when I got saved, and may, many of you I know have had the same experience, when I found out, when I got saved and I found out what I should be doing, how I should be walking, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough. I was, I was binge-watching sermons from Pastor Anderson and Pastor Jimenez and, you know, well, basically those two. But, I mean, I was just, I mean, I, would just, I couldn't get enough. I was just reading the Bible, just, just reading, reading. My wife and I were both this way. You know, we would read a, a, a chapter in the Bible, and if we had problems, you know, we'd listen to a sermon on it. And it was just like, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I felt like, but I had this feeling like a whole new world was being unlocked for me. And I know that many of you have told me this same thing that you have had this experience too. But turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here's what was really happening. Here's what was really happening. 
I just felt like just like these treasures were just being unlocked and so many things were coming together. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was exciting, but at times it was overwhelming. And I mean, because look, the Bible was the Bible my entire life. You know what it was? It was a great mystery to me. It was a great mystery to me. I had heard, oh, this is the best-selling book in the history of all mankind. There will never be a better book than the King James Bible. There, you know, the King James Bible, this and that and this and that. But it was a great mystery of what was actually in that book. I had tried to read it unsaved many times. I've read Genesis chapter 1 like 800 times in my life. But look, it, it just it doesn't make sense until you're saved. But here's what's really happening. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. The Bible here says that this this, this this event that happened is a great mystery to the world. And look at the front of your bulletin. Look at the front of your bulletin, the verse of the week, where Jesus says in Luke chapter 8 and verse number 10, look what he says. Look, people are, people are chosen to know this mystery. You say, are, are you talking about Calvinism, pastor? No, people are chosen to know this mystery, and Jesus tells us who those people are in Luke chapter 8 and verse number 10. This is not the only verse that Jesus said this. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 10, he says, and I say, and he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. This is why you read so many things in the Bible and there's all these Pharisees and all these other people that are just not understanding what Jesus is saying. You're like, how can they not understand? Because it is given to you to know, and not them. You say, what do you mean? Wh who's you? The disciples. The disciples. So look, what's the third thing? Not only are you given hope for a physical resurrection, and you know that you are already spiritually resurrected this morning, but look, here's the third thing that you're given through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, being saved this morning. Mysteries will open to you. Mysteries will open to you. That is a wonderful promise. But notice, it's the disciples. This one, not every Christian is guaranteed to... Some Christians will take this one farther than other Christians. Some Christians will leave this one on the table completely. You say, why? Because being a disciple and being saved are two different things. Being saved is the gift that God has given you. He's just sealed you eternally. He's given you that salvation. Being a disciple is somebody that is doing what they should do and following Jesus. The problem is people marry these together today and now they have a works-based salvation. And that's the whole problem. But if you follow Jesus, if you start walking as you should, if you start working, look, the Bible says these mysteries will be open to you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And look... Not every saved person is going to take advantage of this one, and that's a shame. That's sad, because this is, a, this is a good one. This is a good one. This is why, you know, you have that desire when you're saved, and those people that, that, that push and walk and read and listen, this is why they grow so quickly, because these mysteries are just being unlocked and unlocked and unlocked. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9. I'm going to wait for everybody to get there because I want you to read, I want you to see these words in your Bible. Look at verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. God talks about the things and he compares the things that he's going to show you compared to what you already know. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them, that love him. That's interesting right there. Who loves God? God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Loving God is not being saved. Amen. Like, oh, you know, you don't, you know, look, lots of people are saved and don't love God because love is action, folks. 
Love is doing things. Love is sacrifice. Love is actual doing things, not some feeling of butterflies or lust or whatever the world wants to tell you that it is. It says these things, it says the things that people that love me, people that are actually doing what I've asked them to do, he's like, you have no idea the things that I have in store for you. He's, he's saying in verse number nine, he's saying these things that I have in store for those that are following me and walking in my ways, he's saying the heart of man, he's like, you can't even imagine the things that I have in store for you. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. By his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. God here is saying, you have no idea the things that God will unlock for you, is what the Bible is saying. Verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man? That's, that's your Spirit. That's your will, which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. That's saying, look, the only way that, you know, how do I unlock the, this, the mysteries of the Bible? How do I unlock? He's telling you the mechanics of it right here. He's telling you how it actually works. He's telling you how you're actually going to be able to unlock. Why did I read Genesis 1 800 times in my life and not understand the Bible? Why could I not understand even the Gospels when I was unsaved? Why? Because I didn't have that key that he's talking about here. I didn't have the Spirit of God. I didn't have the Holy Spirit within me. When you get saved, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You become a temple of the Holy Spirit. God gives you the earnest of your salvation. He gives you a down payment of that Spirit inside you. And that is the mechanics of how you can unlock the Bible. Amen. Because this will not be understood, and it explains it in the next few verses, by the natural man without the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Like, this is free. <laughs> this is free. You have the Holy Spirit. That was free. Your everlasting life is free. God just didn't give you everlasting life. He gave you the hope of a physical resurrection. He gave you the spiritual resurrection. He gave you the Holy Spirit inside you. Put that one down as number four. He gave you the Holy Spirit, which will help you understand and unlock these mysteries of the Bible. Amen. That's how it works. That's how it works. You can even pray for God. You say, well, you know, I read some things. You can even pray for the, the Spirit to help you understand things, and it will, it will happen. Amen. It will happen. Which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Holy Ghost will teach you, folks. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Talking about... You will understand the spiritual things because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost inside you will teach you those things. These mysteries are a gift. You say, well, you know, I, I, I don't really feel that way. I don't really feel like, you know, just this desire to unlock these mysteries. Here's why you don't feel that way. Because the Bible just explained it to you. It says comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What do you have to do? You have to get in it. You have to get in it. You have, to, you have to get in the Word and out of the world. Because it's spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Ghost doesn't have anything to teach you about going to the bar. All you're going to do is grieve the Holy Spirit. You're just going to grieve the Holy Ghost. A lot of people's Holy Ghost inside them is just grieving all the time. You say, I've never really felt like this. Well, it's not going to happen by osmosis. You have to get in the Word. You have to read the Word. Look, you got to get sold out in this Christian life. And that's where, I mean, look, I'm going to give you some details and some opportunities on that tonight in great detail on how you can do that in just the next coming few months. But that also means, folks, that not only do you have to get into the Word and get into the spiritual life, but you have to get out of the other stuff. Because one chokes the other. You can't have them both. You can't have them both. That's why we, that's why we preach. I preach is separation, separation, separation. You have to separate from it to get in it. Because if you're in that, you'll hate this. One will kill the other. You say, what do you mean? It'll, it'll kill your spiritual desire. It'll kill your spiritual life. Being in the world and not getting these things out of your life. 
I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is talking about the Holy Ghost will help you compare spiritual things with spiritual. Meaning, as I'm reading the spiritual things of the Bible, the Holy Spirit in me will give me spiritual understanding of those things. And that's why you'll find people that just have this, just this insatiable desire for the Bible. This insatiable desire just to, to just listen to preaching and just to learn more and more and more because they're in the Word and they're unlocking these mysteries and it's just, look, this hasn't stopped for me. This hasn't stopped for me years and years and years after salvation because you say, well, when will you've unlocked everything? Well, it's infinite. The Bible's an infinite book. The more times you read it, the more you get out of it. You say, when will you read the Bible and all of a sudden just know everything? Never. I mean, the more and more will be unlocked to you. And look, and if you want, if you want to just stay in it, every question will be answered for you. That's what the Bible is saying here. That, that's why, you know, I, I've said this many times too, but this is a hard church to be half in. <laughs> you know, this is a hard church to like have one foot in. The reason is because, is you know, most people that aren't going to get all in, well, just they, they don't like being told about things that they're never going to do <laughs> over and over and over again. You know, a lot of people will just, they'll hit a stopping point and they'll say, yeah, you know what? I'm just not going to go any further. I'm just not going to do anymore. I'm just, I, 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 they hit a wall. They hit a wall in their Christian life and and unfortunately, look, any one of you can hit a wall and, and, and keep coming to church here. There, I mean, that's, up to, that's, that's on you. But people don't like being told over and over and over that they should jump over a wall that they're, not just, they're just not going to cross. That's why, you know, a Bible-preaching church is, is, is a tough church to be half in. It just is. But look, I'm trying to tell you this morning that these mysteries are given to you. You're not charged for these. These are free to you. These mysteries, every answer to every question, everything is given to you. You just have to have a desire to want it. And so many people will profit from you unlocking these mysteries because we're to carry these mysteries to the world. We're to carry these mysteries to a lost and dying and confused world Amen. is what we are supposed to do. And look, just quite frankly, out of loyalty, out of loyalty, we should want to unlock these mysteries and use them the way God wants us to use them today. Amen. Look, it's amazing for us personally. It's amazing for our families. It's amazing to know how, you know, no matter how messed up everything else gets, that we have the answers and we have the ability and the solutions and you know, the answers to how to protect ourselves and our spouses and our children from all this wickedness, from all these lies. But it's up to us to carry these things to the world. God is not going to go magically, you know, go soul winning for us. He gave that to us to do. You know, a perfect example of these mysteries is like the end times. The Bible tells us, as we've studied through the end times, the Bible tells us that when, you know, the abomination of desolation happens and the image is set up in the temple and all these things happen and then, you know, the Antichrist says, you know, we must take the mark of the beast. It's like everyone's going to go along with it. Everyone's going to go along with it except the saved believers, except the saints, except us, except the elect. You say, how? Because we know. Because these things are given to us. This is one of the mysteries that's unlocked to us. That's how you're like, how is everyone going this direction today? It's like literally gotten to the point where, you know, people 20 years ago used to look at the Christian life and make, oh, we don't do these activities and we don't go to these places and they kind of snivel down at the Christian. Now, I mean, personally for me, I look at the rest of the world and I'm like, you all are nuts. You all are a bunch of morons. You all are putting your kids there. You guys are doing this. I mean, even when I know people, they don't believe in all this perversion and, and all this stuff that's going on today. But it's because we, we have the mysteries unlocked to us. And God wants us to bring that to the world. I mean, 
People are confused. They're angry. But because of the truth that's told here, we know. We know. Which means we know how to navigate through it. We know how to separate from it. We know how to be successful in that type of environment. So we got three things that I'm trying to point out this morning to you that you've been given, that you benefit from the resurrection. You know, you're saved. Three things that you benefit from. You're going to have a physical resurrection. You're already spiritually resurrected. Actually, turn to, to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. On your, on your resurrection. On your resurrection. Turn to Romans chapter 8. You're going to be physically resurrected one day. You're already spiritually resurrected. Look at verse number 38 of Romans chapter 8. And here's a nice thing about those resurrections, about this life that we're living now. You know, I have my, my vile body. I still have the flesh with me, but I'm spiritually resurrected. I'm, I'm reborn. I'm born again, the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. I did, this is just a great couple verses here. The Bible says in Romans 8, 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature, which shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's interesting, this list of things here. It says angels, principalities, nor powers. It's talking about governments, powers, people on this earth. It's giving basically a list of everything that Jesus defeated here. It's like we don't have to worry about any of this. I can just have hope of physical resurrection one day. I know that I'm spiritually resurrected. I know that I will never lose my salvation because Jesus has conquered literally everything for me. Everything. Nor height, nor depth. There's nothing that Jesus hasn't conquered. This is basically a list of everything Jesus conquered right here that I don't have to worry about anymore. And not only that, do I have that, that rebirth, that spiritual rebirth and that hope of that physical resurrection, but God has given me the Holy Spirit and the mysteries of God. And it is only up to me and how I walk in my Christian life that defines the depths of those mysteries that will be unlocked to me and to you. So that's why the Christian life, look, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting and there's persecution. But it will never stop being exciting because there is no end. It's not like, oh, I got to this level and that I hit the top. There is no end because the, the mysteries are infinite that will be unlocked to us. You just got to ask yourself, turn to Matthew chapter 25, we'll end here. You just got to ask yourself, what type of Christian do you want to be? You know, what type of Christian do you want to be? God has done all these things for you. He not only gave you the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so you could be saved eternally, but then he gave you all these promises that we talked about this morning, all these wonderful gifts on top of that. You know, another word for loyal, you know what that is? Another word for loyal is faithful. Look at Matthew chapter 25 and look at verse 21. This should be our goal. When we get to heaven and we are standing, you know, before Jesus, we should, we, I would want Jesus to say, thank you for being loyal to me. Thank you for being loyal. But there's, there's another word that the Bible uses, and that word is called faithful. Look at verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 21. His Lord said unto him, this is what I would hope that every Christian that's walking and spending their life trying to do what God has asked them to do after he's already freely given you all these things, I would hope that every Christian would want the Lord Jesus Christ to say to them, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Look, I don't know that, that he'll ever say that to me, to somebody like me. I don't know that, but look, this is what my goal is. I wasted a lot of time in my life, and I use that to motivate me. I was wrong for many, many years. I didn't get saved till I was in my mid-30s. And I use that. I don't sit down and cry about it. I use that to motivate me. To be like, you know what? I got to push harder. I got to keep unlocking. I got to keep walking. I got to keep doing these things. Why? To be faithful, to be loyal to Jesus Christ who did everything for me. And that's what the Christian life is all about. So we could maybe have the chance, the dream 
for, for Jesus Christ to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And guess what? Most Christians will pursue nothing in their lives. That's a lot to leave on the table, first of all. But you know what? For everyone else, they are the ones that get hurt the most. For everyone else. Look, they are the people that, I mean, these are the people that, you know that there's people out there. Think about this. Think about this. These are the things. This is why I write sermons in the morning so I can ponder these things. When it's quiet and there's nobody running around the house or whatever. So you can just ponder the mysteries of God. But think about this. There could be a Christian that does nothing in their life and they're saved. And then there could be a, someone who's seeking Someone who wants to be saved or who would be saved if they were preached the gospel. And this person here would be someone that if they knew the gospel would do ten times more than this person ever will. That's quite, a, that's quite a conundrum to think about there. But there's all these people out there. You know, look, it's our job to go to them. Notice I didn't say it's our job to find them. God already knows who they are. God already knows who the people that are seeking are. Well, God doesn't choose people to be saved and who is not to be saved. But he knows who is seeking the truth and who is not. And he sends us to those people that are seeking the truth. Amen. That's how that works. That's the mechanics of that. That's the mechanics of people getting saved. God already knows who they are. It's our job to go. It's our job to go. So look, appreciate the resurrection today. Happy Easter. He is risen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.